Right, let's get into this. And in for this one, we have a man who's played three AFCONs, reaching the 2012 final with the Ivory Coast. Sol Bamba, so good to have you with us. Good to be here. Thank you for the invite, lads. And also flying the flag for the Athletic. And he's going to be heading out himself. Uh, we've got Jay Harris as well. Jay, you're ready, man. 32 degrees out there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just told me that a second ago and I'm a little bit worried now. So I'm definitely going to have to order some shorts in the next week or two. <laughs> Right, let's talk about this tournament. Look, AFCON comes with its controversies, it comes with its drama, and in, in, in Yoruba we call it Wahala, uh, but inevitably the tournament goes on and it provides a spectacle for African fans um, and global fans in, in, in tow. Now, the tournament is being hosted in the Ivory Coast for the first time since 1984. So, mm. this is massive for the Ivory Coast, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely huge. Listen, we're so excited. Obviously, it was meant to be a couple of years before and unfortunately with everything happening in Africa it was a season where it was a lot of rain and all that so we changed it with Cameroon so the, the the fans and the whole country is buzzing we can't wait for it you know we're only a couple of days away from it we really we want to show a good spectacle we want to show to the world we can you know uh, host events like that and I think it'd be it'd be fantastic. I know I'm a bit biased, of course, you know, but honestly, I can't wait. The, the older stage of my already, the fan can't wait. The facilities are there, you know. We we have to give credit to the federation, you know, and our president Alassane Ouattara because he made like a big point where you know he want to make sure like people remember that that have come. So we have to give him credit for that. Like everything is ready, and uh, we just wait for the the player to give us like the best spectacle they can. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they always say, you know, having home advantage could be a really good thing. But that, I mean, the <laughs> pressure's on Avery Coast's shoulders right now to, to perform. Yeah, massively. And I think, listen, the last, the last edition, we didn't do well. We, we, went, we went out on the, against Egypt in, 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 in penalty shooters. So, you know, it was massive disappointment, disappointment for us. We are home, massive pressure. We know we have to deliver. And for ourselves as well, we're a big nation of, of football in Africa. Um, we have to deliver, you know, so we, we're going to be ready, definitely. Yeah, Jay, as I mentioned earlier, you're following Sai out there. Um, you'll be reporting on the knockout stages. How excited are you? I know you've already been to Qatar in 2022, so technically you know what heat feels like, but this is, <laughs> this is Africa, my friend. This is a whole different beast. <laughs> no, obviously, um, I'm so excited. It's always been a dream of mine to to visit Africa. I mean, I went to... Uh, Sham El Sheikh in Egypt when I was mm. 14 and I don't think I left the hotel so <laughs> uh, and obviously Western and Central Africa is very different to uh, yeah, North yeah. Africa so it's always something I've wanted to do so firstly from that mm. perspective to just broaden your horizons and experience mm. different cultures I'm yeah overwhelmed super excited uh, and then of course actually watch the football itself um, I can obviously remember really idolizing the Ivory Coast team that had, you know, Drogba, Yaya, Kolo, and I've spoken to Sal about this before. And then also mm. that Ghana side that had mm. SEN, and Jan and mm. got to the 2010 World Cup. So to go over and watch it firsthand, I'm, I'm yeah, super excited. Yeah, I mean, look, Af AFCON to the continent. And, you know, I was born in Nigeria. I was born in a city called Ibado uh, before we moved to England when I was eight years old. And, you know, AFCON's been in our hearts. You know, we talk about players, golden age, 1994, when Nigeria won <laughs> AFCON. JJ Okacha, <laughs> Peter Rafai, Taribo West, Finidi George, Sunday Elise, Luan Kukanu. I mean, who else can I throw at Ikpeba, Agahoa? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are big, big African names. And I just thinking about it. So, you know, uh, Jay's mentioned some names there as well. I'm thinking about Mustafa Hadji from Morocco. Mm -hmm. You think about Roger Miller from Cameroon. Yeah. I mean, this is a tournament that can name, can, that can make African stars as well and actually propel them to, to the world stage. Absolutely. It's huge. Listen, that, that's just what memory the all the names you just you, you just mentioned there. I remember watching the the 1992 when we won it against Ghana. Uh, I was watching it with my dad, and that 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 feeling you got, you know, um, about African football is just different. You know, uh, like you said, after those tournament, big star uh, ended up a massive club in Europe. You know, and I think is is two things is is it's pride for ourselves or we want to do well for our continent and our country. And at the same time, it puts you on the map to go and play at the, uh, in the best club in the world. But I think first and foremost, all African players will tell you that they want to do well for the continent and for their, their, their respective team. And uh, this tournament is massive and it's getting better, better every year because we got better players playing in a, in a better league. So they mm. bring that back to, to, to the national team. 
and it's only going to get better and better again. So I mean, I'm very excited about it because this one in particular, I think is going to be the toughest one for the last 10, 15 years comfortably because it's, it's probably five or six teams can win it, you know, so I'm so excited about it. Yeah, I want to talk to you about who you think will win it in a second. And, and Jay, from your perspective, I don't know, sometimes we come at this with uh, European goggles and I guess I've got that duality. So I understand that sort of feeling yeah. of like local pride as, a, as an African from, from the continent. But for, for you going out there, Jay, uh, what, what do you feel about AFCON? I mean, are you, are you feeling like I'm going to be seeing some of the greatest players uh, in the Premier League? I'm going to see some of the greatest players in the world. Or are you just there on a cultural journey as well? I think it's a it's a combination of both. Like I'm certainly looking forward to like watching the Ivory Coast team in their home country. Mm. I think the atmosphere is going to be amazing. And um and I had I've had a friend that went to the um 2019 Afcon in Egypt and I remember watching his Instagram stories thinking like this is amazing, get me out there. Mm. It just really felt like a carnival. You obviously mentioned I went to Qatar and the Morocco fans were my highlight of that tournament. I was there when they knocked out Spain on penalties and it was just incredible I, I can't stress to people enough how just absurd Moroccan fans went mm. it was like such a special moment for them and so that was obviously on a on a different continent so to be able to be in a continent that's absolutely living and breathing football and experience that really excited but then you look at some of the players not just in the Premier League you've got obviously Osman who's who's the calf footballer of the year anyways mm. he's been doing yeah. incredible things over the last few seasons really excited to to watch him play but then I also feel like we do often approach this tournament with a bit of a Eurocentric lens, but actually mm. some of the best players are those players that are playing in domestic leagues that completely surprise you and come out of nowhere. So I'm actually probably more looking forward to, to that than the players I do know. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, I mean, we've we got to talk about 2012, man. I'm, I'm really sorry, brother. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I know you were so close to lifting that wonderful AFCON Cup, but I yeah. mean, we were just talking about it earlier, me and the producer guy, and we, we realised... You guys hadn't conceded an entire goal mm. that tournament, but also yeah. you get to the final, and 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 I know it's football. It's got to hurt, hasn't it? It does hurt. Um, it's better now. I've got to say, uh, <laughs> look, definitely better. You look back now when you, it's a mixed feeling because you are proud because you went to the final. But you know, it's a famous say a manager used to say to me all the time: you don't play a final, you win it. You know, and if you don't win it, you remember. So it, it hurt, but obviously looking back, even the whole tournament, we don't, we didn't consider the goal. But even before that, I think it was like a year and a half. Uh, Colo and I were playing centre half, and we didn't consider the goal for for the whole year. And obviously, we 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 went to that tournament and didn't consider any goals the whole tournament as well. So we were very proud about that. And even you know the final, we, we it was nil nil, and we lost in penalties, but. You know, you look back and you 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 proud about all those small things, but the bigger picture it was about it's, it's about winning and lifting that trophy. And we we were very unfortunate we didn't do it. You know, um, spoke to Jock back a couple of weeks ago. Still hurt him because mm -hmm. you know he played longer than me in the national team. I think I played over ten years, and you know we we never won it. We went to a couple of World Cup. We played a few uh, African Cup of Nations, but never won it. And the minute we stop, the year after or two years after. They ended up winning it in, in, in 20, 2015, you know, so <laughs> you are happy because it's your country. But deep down, you know, you're like, you know, I messed the trick here, you know. And as you know, African, we've got big family, brother and sister and mm. a lot of family, cousin and all that in Ivory Coast. And every time they talk to me about this, why did you stop the year as they won? I said, I wasn't supposed to know that, you know, <laughs> and they still bring that up all the time. So it does hurt. And uh um, you know, to be part of of of, of that and know ending up lifting the trophies, it was very very disappointing for me. What does it feel like to play with a a, a golden generation? Um, because we talk about Kolo, we talk about Yaya in that team. We look at uh, Emmanuel Ebue, we look at uh, Drogba, Kalou, Javinho. I mean, top top players playing in big clubs uh, across Europe. I've never been able to speak to any of the Super Eagles and ask them what that felt like <laughs> at their time. But for you, being part of that sort of next wave of of African superstars, what does that feel like? You know what? You to be fair, we don't we don't think about it because you you play, you come in, uh, you, you train with them, you, you laugh with them, and uh, you know you, you're disappointed with them when you lose game. You don't see it that way. I think the way when we realized we are the golden generation, it was when we played friendly games in Europe. I remember we played France one day, and at the end of the game, we had Patrick Vieira came in the dressing room. At, at the time, I think he was playing with Colo um, uh, at Arsenal, and he said to us, "You guys are just." 
crazy. And we were all like, wow. He said, but because you focus on winning the AFCON because you haven't won it since 92. But the team you got and the generation you got, you should have think about winning the World Cup, you know. Mm. And we all look at each other and said, to be fair, he got a point here. And he said, that's how you guys have to see. But we don't look ourselves like that. We knew we were good players and we had a great generation. But we went, between ourselves, we were never saying we had a golden generation. That was for journalists or fans, you know. But now, when we retire and we all talk to each other still sometimes and we realise we had a very, very, very good team. A bit like England, you know. England always mentioned like they are the golden generation and they never won anything. Mm. I think when you're in it, you don't realise and when you stop, you're like, gosh, we missed a trick there, you know. Mm, massive, massive. Well, let's talk about who we're looking at in terms of favourites for, for the tournament. Obviously, Ivory Coast will be one. I'll, I'll come back to you in a second, so But Jay, from a, a journalistic point of view, like who, who who are you looking at? Who are you thinking? Do you know what? I know Senegal won it last year, but you mentioned Morocco as well. I mean, we can't mm. forget what they did in the World Cup. Yeah, of course, Morocco are definitely going to be up there. First African team to, to ever reach the semi-finals of a World Cup. I mean, Walid Ragwawi, what he did with that team was was incredible. They've obviously got Ziyech, uh, Amrabat, Aguerd at the back, um, Hakimi. How could I nearly forget Hakimi? <laughs> so they're obviously definitely serious contenders. Um, and they've got, I think, a reasonably pleasant group. I know they've got um, mm. DR Congo in there, Tanzania, and I've forgotten the other team, my bad. Mm. But I, they should pretty much get out of it. Um, Senegal, you can't discount. Obviously, Mane, Koulibaly, Mendy, probably in their own golden generation, as it were. Alucise is an incredible coach as well. They've got a player called Lamine Kamara, who I'm quite interested to see what he does. Um, he's basically the CAF Young Player of the Year. He won the Player of the Tournament at the um, Under-20 Africa Cup of Nations last year. So really excited to see where he fits into the equation. And then obviously Nigeria. I mentioned Osimhen earlier, but it's not just Osimhen. Really, unfortunately, Victor Boniface has been incredible mm. for Leverkusen this season. Yeah. He's had to pull out with, with injury and he's had to undergo surgery, actually. Um, but, I mean, Osman still got Chukwesi, who's at AC Milan, Lookman, Atlanta, and obviously English fans will know well from his time with um, Everton and Fulham in the Premier League. Um, they've got Calvin Bassey, who's, you know, a phenomenal defender. Mm. They've got Frank Onyeka at Brentford. Um, so, I think all through that Nigeria team, there's a lot of quality, but they've not actually had that good results in the last 12 yeah, to 18 really months. Uh, yeah, as you know, so it's about whether you can actually find that blend in time for the big tournament or not. What are you thinking, Sol? Well, obviously, I'm going to be biased, but it's not just <laughs> for biased reason. But Avery, of course, have to be up there. We are home. Uh, we, we, we've we got a very, very good squad. I think it depends on the system you want to play and which, which player is going to start. Uh, the last three friendly games, we play three different systems. So we have to wait and see on that. I think, obviously, Morocco have to be up there. Egypt, because they, they got the know-how, they won the seven times, mm -hmm. you know. And obviously Senegal, because of um, uh, the, the, the African uh, champions. Um, so all, but if someone can do it, I think it's definitely going to be Senegal. But funny enough, I don't jump on my floor. I didn't put Nigeria in there for only oh. reason I would say. No, you know what? <laughs> That's why I said don't jump why? on me. <laughs> do you know what? Can we just take him off now? No, more. no, you know what? <laughs> You're going to agree with me right here, because exactly like Jay said, Going forward, top players, you know, obviously Boniface mm. would be a massive loss. But for me, as you know... AFCON's not about goals. AFCON's exact, not about goals. AFCON's exactly. not about goals. You, you You're, right. You're, right. You You're right. You're right. You said it. You're right. You're right. I, I was just about to tell you that defensively, you have to be top mm. to, to, to go all the way to the final and win it. It's not going forward and it's not scoring goals. You know what we said? Mm. Strikers score goals and win the game and mm. defender win your title. And I think, unfortunately... <laughs> Unfortunately, Nigeria doesn't have that. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and the, the preparation into this has been shocking for, for Nigeria. Really dropped some serious games. And it's been, I mean, from, from a Nigeria fan's perspective, I mean, some of the conversations are like, how do you have such a team at this point and not really do much yeah. with it? And there have yeah. been some speculations about whether or not the coach is uh, good enough for Nigeria. But that's a whole different conversation. And I, I, it's so fascinating because um, I find it really interesting with Afcon Seoul. In the African football is usually about attack, skill, speed. And then you come to AFCON and there aren't that many goals. Isn't that so bizarre? It's such an irony, isn't it? Yeah, you spot on and it's hard to put a finger on it. But I think, obviously, I don't want to look for excuses, but the pitch mm. is that's, that's not always great. Mm. You know, we have to be better on this. The heat doesn't necessarily help, even if we African are used to it. If you play in Europe, you know, most of your career and when you come like for, for months in Africa, it's difficult to get used to it. 
you know, and teams are just more aggressive and, 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 mm. and, and well organized now when they know if you don't if you stop the, the, the good striker scoring goals, you can score on set pieces and, and win one nil. So mm. it's 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 weird, you know, it's such an irony, you're right, but I've gone winning I've gone is not about scoring goals, it's about having a good defence and going as far as you can. So yeah, can sure. can I ask you a question quickly? Yeah, What's going on with Wilfred Zaha not being in the Ivory Coast squad? Is that yeah, well, unusual yeah, situation? Be, yeah, exactly. I'm going to be totally honest with you guys. I think the manager mentioned um, the balance of the team. He said, oh, I've got already three, four uh, 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 white winger um, and white foot players. Well, to me, that's an excuse. Listen, you, you, you pick your top player and as a manager, it's your job to, 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 to get the best out of them, you know. But I think the truth is... Uh, we didn't have a good behavior every time he came to us. You know, he came late. Um, he pick and choose when what, what game he want to play. Mm. Uh, he asked to, to 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 come like two days before games. You know, and that's the problem. And the the, the biggest reason as well, he didn't he didn't gel with the rest of the group. Mm. Is is you know is is he's a funny character. You know, he's, he's he's a lovely guy, but he keep himself for himself. You know, he doesn't mm. he doesn't speak to anybody, and that you know. In the group and in African culture, doesn't doesn't go well, you know, and mm-hmm. that's the one of the reason why you haven't been picked because purely quality wise, you, you have to be on the squad 100. percent But you know, we, we have to be honest. We we all know is is because of his behavior, you haven't been picked. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in that conversation around um, uh, squad harmony because I don't think a, a lot of people realize what it's like when you get all these African boys back together in their home teams, <laughs> right? Like, you know, that, that harmony is really important. For yeah. you, what was it like going out on tour with the boys from the Ivory Coast? I, I mean, what was the hotel vibe like? What was going on? <laughs> no, listen, it's great, you know, uh, because it's exactly that, it, it, you know, it's an African culture and vibe, you know, it's music all the time in the dressing room between ourselves is a lot, a lot of banter. You know, we came from different, vill- we're all from different villages, so we, we take the bleak of each other about it. You know, <laughs> it's, it's great when it's good, but it can be nasty too. Mm. And, and that is, you know, the main problem because when it's not so good, it come out. And we know very good to keep it between ourselves, you know, and I think that's, that's, that's why you, you, you hear a lot of story about, you know, bonuses or, or a flight mm. problem or whatever. That we have to do better, definitely, you know, as, as the European team. But at the same time, we need to keep it between ourselves and make sure, you know, we sort that out between us, you know. But if, if, you, know, if you know someone will be like this, you know, being, you know, interactive and being with a, with a, with a group and laugh and joke, mm. you're going you're gonna to be left alone because that's what we like to do, you know. And in Zaz's case, unfortunately, that's his problem. Yeah, just, yeah sure. just sorry, just quickly to add a bit more context. Mm. So, Sol's right. If you look at um, Zaha's appearances for, for the Ivory Coast, he only played twice in 2023. Um, he obviously went to the Africa Cup of Nations in Cameroon a couple of years ago, but I think he only played four or five more games for the rest of the year. Um, you know, if you go on transfer marked and you look at his international appearances, it's a lot of it's red where he's unavailable for whether it's through injury or, or he's pulled out. So it's a shame to to see a player of his talent not go to the tournament. But if um, Jean-Louis Gasset is looking at it from a perspective of, yeah, I want people who are committed and who know that my way of playing, especially if he's trying out different systems, then you can maybe understand the decision a little bit more as much as a shame as it is. As ahead of the tournament, one of the most heated debates has centred around Manchester United and Cameroon goalkeeper Andre Onana and his involvement in the tournaments. Join us to talk about his inclusion in the Cameroon squad, who he plans to join up with after Manchester United's Premier League game with Tottenham on Sunday. We have the Athletics football writer, Mark Critchley. Oh, Mark. Andre Onana, man, like, where do we even start? I mean, from, from his appointment as goalkeeper to Manchester <laughs> United to a few gaps in the Premier League to whether or not he's even going to AFCON. I mean, the issues with Samuel Eto alone. Where do we begin with this? Talk to me. So he withdrew from Qatar 2020 to the World Cup squad there and he announced his international retirement. He's since been brought back into the Cameroon fold, but not going to AFCON till technically the day he plays the match or 24 hours before he plays the match. Can you just clarify this, please? Well, yeah, you you pretty much made the best (laughs) of a a very complicated situation right there in your summary, I've got to say. Um, It's been an absolute nightmare to cover from the start. But yes, um, Anano 
we have to start the World Cup last year. So Anana retired from international football following that tournament. He played in the first game against Switzerland. He was dropped for the next game against Serbia. Um, at the time, this was kind of characterised as a falling out between him and head coach Rigobert Song. But you're right, it was more of a disagreement with Samueto, who is the president of the Cameroonian F FA now um, and has been since 2021. Um, our understanding is that that was it was kind of over Anana's playing style. We all know he's a goalkeeper who likes to, uh, you know, he, he he likes to play the ball. He likes to take risks. Eto felt that he should play more conservatively, and Anana felt that would be him not staying true to himself, if you like. Um, so he was dropped for the Serbia game. He watched that from the hotel, and after it had finished, he he got a flight ticket and a boarding pass saying you're on your way back home. And and so he retires for international football. And usually, right, that would be the end of it. And um, you wouldn't expect him to be playing for, for Cameroon again. And that was very much the case when he joined Manchester United this summer. But um, I think there's, <laughs> that's not the way that it's transpired since. And I think that's for two reasons. So firstly, Anana, kind of like Eto before him, really, he's, he's the star of Cameroonian football. And for him not to be playing for Cameroon is seen as a failing on, on the Federation's part, on, on everyone involved's part, basically. And so... Quite a lot of influential interest in Cameroon wanted to see this matter resolved um, for AFCON. So that's the first thing. Secondly, and I've got to say the most fascinating thing that I've I've found out while covering the story is that there's actually no way to really retire from international football. There's no kind of exhaustive rules and no set process around the way you do it. The rules do say any player can retire from international football. You have to tell the federation that you don't want to be selected anymore. And that's how it works. And in 99.99% of cases, <laughs> that's the end of it. Um, this is the 0.001% or whatever, right? Unfortunately for all of us. So the rules also say, that, importantly, the rules also say that when a player receives a call up, they're expected to accept it. And I think, so essentially, Anana's in the position where what happens when you retire from international football, but the Federation picks you anyway. And that is the kind of gap in the rules that has has been uh yeah that has been the issue here um so yeah um i think there's been a lot of talk over the last few months over whether about this being his decision if you like and will he go or won't he go i think the, the longer this story went on it kind of became clearer and clearer that cameroon were going to call him up whether he wanted to, them to or not and so um when he got that first recall in august um he after a few days after the talks with lawyers him and his team that was accepted as much as a player can accept it he went played played against Burundi. They qualified for the Afcon. Um, he's played twice more since then. The relationship with Eto is, from my understanding, is no better than it was a year ago. I think you can see in some of the statements that were released at the time when he came back. You didn't have to read too hard between the lines to see that there's still some tension there. But Anana still loves Cameroon, still wants to represent his country, and the result is this kind of compromise where he plays as many games as possible for United pre-Afcon and then arrives and and plays. Uh, what I mean, uh, firstly, so have you officially retired, or have you told them that you're <laughs> ready to come back? Whatever, just got to check. Just got to no, check. Man needs a go. Don't worry about that. It won't pick me. <laughs> but I mean, this is quite this is quite a, a, a bizarre one, isn't it? And we yeah. talked about Wilfred Zaha. So the, the coach naturally just made that decision. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I mean, th th what kind of president is he setting for for African football? But also, in terms of the profile of the tournament, you've got the star of the team. He's a big name, clearly for Cameroon. Kind of picking and choosing when he's able to come. Yeah, that's what hurt me most, to be honest. Are you? And I think that's where, if you don't respect you know, your own country and your own continent. Because for me, that's disrespectful. Nobody else would, would respect the country and the continent. And that's the problem. We send the wrong message time and time again. You decide to retire. You just needed to speak. Because all this, to me, is just excuses all, all around. Because we had this with Jogba. In 2015, it's exactly the same. The manager wanted him to come. He, he made it clear. He said, no, he's done it. He doesn't want to come. It's common sense. And the manager didn't pick him. Unfortunately, they went and won it. And obviously, mm. uh, DJ was disappointed. But what you do is make sure for the both parties, you do the right thing. If Onana doesn't want to go anymore, yes, Marcus Poon is a superstar in Africa and in Cameroon. But if he doesn't want to play for the country, I'm telling you one thing, the player won't be happy because mm. if you come in, you want to, to come and defend your country and be, be, be proud and, and happy to represent your country. Is million and million Cameroonians can be pecked, you know, and then no, they, they're seeing that and saying, like, he's just pecking and choosing, like, when to come and present the country. That will hurt them a lot. 
So to me, if Onana want to go, he will go because he's a good goalkeeper and a superstar. If he doesn't want to go, you have to make it clear and the federation will respect that and and and, and no pick him. But all this to me is a big mess and it's disrespectful for, for, for him and the, the, the country and the continent. Critch, does this play into the hands of United a little bit? I'm just thinking, you know, they could probably say, look, we bought a player who we didn't think was ever going to go on international duty. Do you know what I mean? And that's the biggest conversation, isn't it? Premier League teams losing their top stars to a tournament it, right at a pivotal time in the season. Yeah, look, I think um, that is a key point in this, is that from Anana's perspective as well, I think, is that he, when he signed for United, um, that was under the impression that he wouldn't be missing these games. And um, he said he told them that in good faith as well, in absolute good faith. He didn't expect to be going back because he didn't think those relationships could be reconciled. Um, and to be honest, they haven't been really. As I said, like that's all still the case, but a, a very strange and almost unique set of circumstances means that things have changed. So I think from Anana's perspective was if he was going to um, mm. accept, <laughs> in, in air quotes, the, the call up, and he, if he was going to return to Cameroon, a condition of that had to be that the impact on United was minimised. And, um, you know, I've said the rules, I've mentioned these rules, they don't stick up for an honour. They, they don't really stick up for the clubs either. And maybe they probably shouldn't, right? I think it's right that nations competing at AFCON and any any tournaments mm-hmm. can go to a big club like Manchester United and say, actually, we, we want your goalkeeper. Yeah, I don't yeah. care if he's 40, 50 million pound goalkeeper or whoever. We, we need this player for this tournament. And that's right that they should be released for the tournament. But um, this... Yeah, I also think that it's right that if, if Onana feels that he has a duty to United to be available for them as much as possible because that was what was agreed when he signed and that was his expectation when he signed, then it's right that you know United fight his corner and want his wishes to be respected. And I think in the end, actually, what's happened is a compromise that is a bit weird, it's a bit funny, but it does suit all parties in the end. And we'll see whether he, he's playing in the first game against Guinea. Maybe the turnaround's too tight. Um, but he's going to he's going to be leaving straight after he's literally getting out of Old Trafford, going to the airport, getting a private jet and flying over to the Ivory Coast. And and look in this re- such a complex situation. That's just about. Yeah, but to be fair, Mark, sorry, I jump on there. Yeah. No, he's, on the pla- he's on he's on the player. It's not on United. Yeah. United have nothing to do with it, in my opinion, because uh, what I'm, I'm I'm annoyed with is when before Onana got to United, he didn't miss any call up. He was there for every mm-hmm. game. He played tournament and he raised his profile. Now you're ending up with one of the best clubs in the world. You don't want to represent your country anymore. That's the problem, you know, mm-hmm. and it shouldn't be the case. The country helping you to get to the best club in the world and now you're there, you're like, oh, I'm not bothered. Like, what's going on? You know, mm-hmm. for me, United is doing nothing wrong at all. Sorry, Jay, go on. No, I was just going to say, um, I feel for Anana a little bit because I think he's been put in a very tricky situation and, and I think more questions need to be asked of Samuel Eto'o in this situation. Firstly, mm. because of the fact that, of course, he's the president of the Cameroon football, Fekafoot, I think they're called. Of course, mm. he will put his input on team selection, but I think he's clearly crossed the line in terms of telling Rigobert Song at the World Cup in 2022, drop him if he's yeah. you know, not going to our demands. I, th- I think that's wrong. Um, and then the fact that he's sent him home afterwards, I think is wrong. I don't think... I don't perceive that as good leadership. You should try and find some sort of um, middle ground. And, and, and I, even the fact that he watched his team at a World Cup from the hotel, I think is just quite demeaning. And then mm. also, I think we should also point out, Eto's not covered himself in glory with some other situations as well, because he is you know, being investigated by the Confederation of African Football over some alleged match fixing. So mm. he... I feel like not enough people are kind of talking about his role in the situation. Yes, Onana, it's ultimately his decision. But I also think that more then Eto needs to be more accountable for some of the things he's done because he clearly is not setting the greatest example. And it feels to me a little bit like if Eto wasn't in charge, then this issue may be a bit of a non-issue. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah that's fair. Critch. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Sorry to just drop you in for for this chat, but I know uh, you know you're across it, so we thought we'd just get you in for it. I really appreciate it and enjoy watching the tournament, brother. Nice one. No problem. Uh, Thanks, guys. So, just a, a, a quick one. Um, I'm I'm just want to touch on something actually. It just made me think about it in terms of that balance of dealing with big European stars 
and they come back to the African team setup that might not be quite in sync. Mm. Sometimes, you know, as, as a fan of the game, you sometimes see it that, you know, some of the players don't necessarily have respect for the institutions they're coming back to because, look, you know, I think about JJ Koch, I think about uh, Kanu. I mean, those guys are on big money in, in big, yeah. big clubs, Inter Milan, yeah, yeah, Juventus, yeah. Yeah. Paris Saint-Germain. And then you come back to something and it's like, I might not get paid mm. this week or whatever. Yeah. How do you take that seriously? I mean, how do we get that balance? Yeah, it's difficult. Like You're not going to lie, but I think right, you need to remember where you come from. To me, it's as simple as that. Because before being a superstar and earning a lot of money and playing for those clubs, you were playing in those in the streets in Africa, and you were you, you would give anything to be to, to represent your country. So I think you need to remember that a little bit. I think what is good is those big players raise the bar for the standards. Because I remember the first um, call up I had with the first team, we travel and Drogba was raging because the travel condition wasn't good, right? Uh, the hotel wasn't good. The, the boss came and picked us up late. And he's like, listen, I'm not going to come anymore. And everyone was like scared. And he said, because I'm not being like a diva on it and like that, right? I'm in one of the top clubs in the world. Everything is is, is looked after for me to be the, 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 on the best condition to perform. You guys, it's trouble, it's late, it's this, it's this. If you want me to perform at the highest level and to be as good as I am with Chelsea, you have to change this. And that is doing it the right way. And this is okay, in my opinion, because you just want to raise the bar for us to be better, you know. But if you if you worried about the money you're going to get or you don't want to come because now you think you're bigger than your country, this is wrong. Mm, for sure. All right. I mean, look, uh, AFCON isn't... Uh... <laughs> is well known let's be honest for certain controversies pay all that kind of stuff before yeah. the before the <laughs> tournament but also i mean look i i don't want this to diminish uh, the quality of the tournament and yeah. the strides yeah. that, that the tournament has made over the last few years it's an exciting watch and pretty much loads of africans globally tune in to watch it but i mean I, I can't dismiss what's happening with the gambian players right now you know um they have gone on strike due to financial issues once again and i don't know if you've seen it but it was a piece that was just sent to me just now um, from uh, former Manchester United defender uh, Sadi Janko, who says the players are on a flight and that the, the mm. flight has had to basically made an emergency stop because yeah. um, there was no aircon on, on it, the yeah. flight. Yeah. I mean, mm. they've been you know been travelling for about thirty odd hours from Saudi Arabia where they were training uh, at, at camp, and they're supposed to be at the tournament in, in what mm. twenty four hours or so. I mean, this yeah. is not the best preparation, is it, Sol? But that's the problem, though, but, and that's what I always said, and that's what I was saying about the standards of, like, you know, how we, we, we all have to do better as a, as, a, as, a, as a continent. Because, like I said, all those small things, like, you know, details are, are very important, and all those small things make you a, 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 a bigger team, a bigger country. Mm -hmm. And that's why we don't understand our, our representatives have to do better. You know, the president of federation, the president of, 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 of CAF, like on Africa and everything. They have, even themselves, they got problem with FIFA and everything. You know, that's where we have to do better to make sure mm -hmm. it's no corruption. Because sometimes it happens, unfortunately, in Africa, you know, and until all that's going to be sorted, we all, we're never going to be taken seriously. And we know, mm -hmm. we know as a players, that the, our federation, every uh, um, team we qualify for the uh, AFCON, they got paid by FIFA and from, mm. from the CAF. So our, our representatives, they have to do better with the money. You know, yes, it's always argument about policies. And at the end, we always find a way. But traveling situation have to be spot on because mm. for them to travel, like you said, from Saudi Arabia to Avery Coast is a long flight, no aircon. The fly have to turn back to go back to where mm. it came from. Like we're talking about safety. Come on. You know, mm -hmm. and that until we're going to be better on this, we, we're never going to be taken seriously. And I think it's just worth pointing out that, you know, obviously we've got players coming from around the world. And, you know, I, I think um, Yanko is at Young Boys at the moment. Um, so obviously he, he's earning a good wage, but it's yeah. the other players, the local players that really suffer from this. You know, Absolutely. this is yeah. a major opportunity for local players to be seen by the world. Potential moves to Europe, potential moves globally. And actually, if they don't get paid, they don't get fed, man. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's where it, it's a tricky one for us because when I was playing, most of our players were playing in Europe. You know, we had a couple, one or two were playing in, in, in Africa. But exactly like you said, we used to fight for those people because they need a 
bigger and better exposure. Um, you know, they need that money, you know, and that's why we need to remember. But even the principal, to be honest, most of the, of the players didn't need the money we're getting from the AFCON, mm -hmm. but it's the principal, you know, and it have to be why, because we know the money is coming in, so it have to be shared equally mm -hmm. and, and, and why, whatly, you know, as simple as that. But the smaller team, if I can put it this way, 100% they need to, you know, they need that money and they need the exposure, so they need to come to those tournaments and show themselves. OK, well, let's move on because ahead of the tournament, the Athletic will be releasing a dedicated edition of The Radar featuring a number of standout teams and players to watch out for during AFCON. Now, joining us, a man that loves delving through data. This guy absolutely lick his, licks his lips at data. We've got Tom <laughs> Harris with us. He's going to be contributing to The Radar. Tom, talk to us as some of, about some of the, the exciting themes that people who might be tuning into AFCON for the first time should be looking forward to seeing in this tournament yeah i mean there's plenty to get stuck into i mean we've got 24 players from 18 different nations uh, involved in the radar this year so that's you know lots of coverage for lots of nations that we don't usually talk about um and some really interesting players you know from the likes of guinea bissau and um, zambia we've got a few players in and you know mali just lots and lots of teams that we, we're not talking about on a regular basis but they have players who have the potential to light up this tournament particularly because afcon is so unpredictable and there are some talents in there, you know, even Bebe, who's playing for, for Cape Verde, he gets a good mention. Is he still of... playing football? The Man United guy? <laughs> he's still playing football and he's still got it. And, you know, that kind of talent, that mercurial talent where you can just kind of click into gear and uh, light up a game and light up a tournament. Yeah, I think it's going to be great fun. Yeah, what I just wanted thinking, to... Yeah, I mean, um, we haven't spoken about Ghana yet, which seems quite strange because mm. they are really one of the, the powerhouses of the continent. And... I'm really invested in Ghana. Obviously, mentioned earlier about um, you know fond memories of watching them at the 2010 World Cup. I got the chance to watch them in um, in Qatar as well. I'm really nervous. Um, they've not had great results. They were really erratic at the World Cup. Um, they lost. I think it was two nil to Mexico in October, four nil to the US, and I should point out they were four nil down by by half time. Um, they did beat Madagascar in World Cup qualifying um, with a goal in the last minute from Anaki Williams, but then they lost to the Comoros in the next game very much feels like all of their chips are on uh, somebody you may have heard of called Mohamed Kudos. Um, but he's, yeah. he's you know, Good he hasn't man. been able to train with them that much because he's been struggling with, a, I think it's a hamstring injury. So mm. Chris Hewton, obviously former Brighton, um, Nottingham Forest, Newcastle United manager, is their, their head coach these days. Um, and I worry he's not worked out what his starting 11 is. You know, they finished mm. bottom of their group at the last tournament. And that was a fiasco. And I, I do quite worry that they won't get to the last 16 again. And when you consider that, I should point out, it's a 24-team tournament, 16 teams progress to the knockout stages. So the top two from every group and then the four third best place sides. Mm. I'm a little bit worried that they, they, they won't go as far as they should do in this tournament. Mm. And Tom, I'm just thinking um, Nigeria... Uh you know, mentioned them there. Saul's not confident uh, <laughs> because there's the firepower, but no defensive power. Yeah. Um, what, what are your thoughts uh, in, in that respect? And also, let's not forget Morocco as well, as we mentioned at the top of the pod. Yeah, I mean, Nigeria, obviously, it's mouth-watering, really, the, the options that they have up front. I think some of the names in there, obviously, Aussie men is a big one, but, you know, Adamola Luckman has kind of gone under the radar a little bit, I think. And mm. Atalanta has been playing really well and he's been basically operating on a goal contribution a game over the last two seasons. So he's he's going to be a live wire at the top of that team. But yeah, I think that game between, you know, Nigeria and Ivory Coast is going to be really interesting just because it is mm. that, you know, start of the attack versus this interesting defence with lots of really, you know, up-and-coming defenders, young up-and-coming defenders in that game. But yeah, I mean, another team people don't seem to be mentioning too much, which I found quite strange, is Algeria. Because, you know, they mm. have only really lost... They've won it. Yeah, and they, they lost one game in 2023, and that was a final, which they lost on penalties. Yeah. They're on uh, a, a crazy unbeaten run. Obviously, there's Riyad Mahrez in there, but there's also uh, Amin Guiri, who's a 24-year-old by the time the tournament starts. Striker, who's got 15 goals in Liga in last season. They've got a strong midfield. Ben has come back into that, the AC Milan midfielder. I think, you know, they, they've got a favourable group as well. No disrespect to Angola and Mauritania, but they should be mm. beating those nations. So I think they've got a, a decent chance of, of making a good run for it as well. Yeah. All right. So we haven't mentioned the, 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 the awaiting King of Africa, Mo Salah, who hasn't actually lifted 
the Cup of Nations Cup. I mean, this is bizarre. That, that He's got close, a bit like you. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. mean he's a bad player, a bit like you. He, he's got close. But, you know, this would be that moment, is it? wouldn't it? Like, you know, he, he's not getting any younger. Mm. This Egypt team really needs to produce something, don't they? Absolutely. And it's weird to think, like, you know, Egypt won seven times and Salah haven't won it, you know. Uh, I mean, listen, for for the player you represent um, for the country and what he's done for his own country, for the continent, sorry, and what he's done for his own country, mm-hmm. he'd be great. I don't think he'd be this one because that's for us. That's for our vehicles. Let's put it this way, right? <laughs> we winning that, okay? But for him, I, I will love it, you know, for, for everything he's done. He won the Premier League. He won absolutely everything he can win in the game, the mm-hmm. Champions League. You know, he'd be great. <clears throat> Excuse me. And why he represents for Egypt as well, you know, it'd be wonderful for him. And I think that's the only thing he's missing. So, you know, I think they've got a good chance. They've got to know how, you know, they, they're always on the last four, you know. Uh, they won it seven times, it's a record. So, you know, they've got they've got their chance, definitely. Mm, I, I want to finish on this. So we've sort of, Tom's spoken about my favourite game of the tournament. Nigeria Ivory Coast. I mean, come on, man! Like this is this is a, a battle of the powerhouses. So yeah. you must be licking your lips at that one. Oh, I can't wait! I can't wait because, as you know, you like it's a big rivalry because between us, us two, in it, you know. Um, the pressure is on us because we're playing at home. You know, yeah. Um, you got like some strong firepower in front, like we all, like we said. We got relatively young defense, so it's going to be interesting to see. Be a big test for us. Uh, but you know, you never, you never win in our vehicles. Never. We, we lose. A, we, you know, you win a lot of time in Legos, and that, that's fine. We we'll give you that. But in our own turf, it's got no chance for you guys to win because you know if that's the case, I can't go out anymore. You know? No, nah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. you. I think you played. Did you not play in the team that played Nigeria in 2013? I, I think you played the, the Super Eagles as well. Absolutely. Yes. What were your yes. memories of playing the Super Eagles? Because that that team was pretty decent as well. Oh, it was very, very good. Yeah, I remember in front, you, you, you had top players, and uh, you give me give me a very, very difficult time with me and Polo. You know, we actually lost that game because we got beat in 2013. I know. That's why I mentioned you. it. That's why I mentioned yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, well, that's the problem though, because we, we, we really rarely lose against you guys, as you know. Mm. So when that's the case, we always get remembered, you know? Yeah. So that one is the last time we lost against you guys. And trust me, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult memory to remember. But, um, <laughs> this one, you know, you know, winning, whatever you do, 100% you're not going to win that game. I'm telling you now. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I would love it. I would absolutely <laughs> love Nigeria to be Ivory Coast on home turf. Can you imagine no the chaos of Lagos? <laughs> there, there would be no, look, look, the traffic would go on for three hours, bro. <laughs> People getting out of their cars, dancing on their cars exactly. if Nigeria beat the Ivory Coast in Ivory Coast. Uh, Jay, Jay, a, a, any any mouthwatering ties? Any ones you look you're looking at, thinking, oh God, this could be really special. Yeah, so I think um, Egypt, Ghana, obviously um, mm. Salah versus Kudos, two of the best African talents, and you know personally, two of the best talents in the Premier League as well. Um, please keep an eye out on Group C. It's um, Cameroon, Guinea, Senegal, and I've actually forgotten what the other team is. But but those mm. three, you're probably going to say every time they play each other, that's going to be an incredible occasion. Cameroon versus mm. Senegal in particular, yeah. um, and then just another thing which intrigued me, Tanzania. Um, so I think it's yes. they're the second lowest ranked side in the tournament in their opening game have the small task of taking on Morocco. And obviously one of the reasons we all love these tournaments is because of the upsets. And I'm not saying Tanzania are about to produce an upset, but I think mm-hmm. what an amazing challenge that Tanzania will go ahead and, and do that. Um, so I think that will be a good fun as well. Yeah, I also think that, you know, I've sort of mentioned it earlier, like, you know, net, if I look at the Super Eagles, for instance, names like Peter Rufai, like a, a goalkeeper that not many people knew, the African Cup of Nations was a really wonderful tournament for him to be seen by the world, Sol. And that is it again. We're, we're being introduced to some young gems that could be stars of the future. Absolutely. And that's why we love it, really. You know, um, Jay was mentioning uh, uh, Gambia. I think it's in- it'd be interesting mm. to see, uh, you know, so many. I, I was part of, unfortunately, that upset when... Uh, um, Zom- uh, Zombia yeah, beat us, you know, in the final in 2012. You know, uh, so listen, it's it's it's, that, it's why we love the tournament. There's so many upset, it's so unpredictable, like Tom said. You know, so we we really really excited. And like I said before, I think it's probably going to be the toughest one for the for the last 10 15 years. So I'm so excited. I can't wait for 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 the tournament to start. 
So I'm gonna you're gonna get a, a social media message off me. You know that Nigeria oh, Coast is happening. D- d- just, yeah, just let let, but, let let the battle commence. Yeah, definitely. But you'd be so disappointed. You won't even actually text me because you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's end it there before it gets too feisty. So, Jay, Tom, and also Mark, really appreciate your time. And also, before I forget, the radar drops on The Athletic on Friday. All Tom's hard work and loads of people's hard work has gone into that. So make sure you check it out. Please remember to rate and review the podcast if you're enjoying it. Enjoy AFCON as it kicks off. And you can also subscribe to The Athletic for $2 or £2 a month for 12 months. Just head to theathletic.com forward slash football pod. If you like this video, click subscribe for more content like this. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Carl Lanker, and plenty more through the season to bring you the inside track to the biggest stories in football. If you'd like to listen to the full episodes for free, search The Athletic Football Podcast wherever you get your podcasts from.